Enough with unmasking meddling kids already. It's time for Super 70s Sci-Fi Saturday Mornings. We're changing channels from Supernatural to Science Fiction. I'm Victor and straight out of the gen experience, after solving another mystery, we wanted thrills of the sci-fi kind. So we tuned into adventures from the deep ocean to distant galaxies, settle into another Saturday morning serial, and catch up with more classic cartoons from our weekend ritual. Made not to sell toys, but to inspire our imagination. We couldn't wait for the next installment of Flash Gordon or the journeys of the crew of the Starship Enterprise. The way the legacy of this Filmation animated series holds makes me afraid to do it justice. There are so many fans, including myself, I do not want to shortchange such an important sci-fi Saturday morning program. Not only did I enjoy watching it, but it sparked my interest in watching and appreciating Star Trek The Original Series, whose success and syndication made way for this animated offspring debuting in 1973. Of course, watching both versions at the same time in reruns may have only been slightly confusing to young viewers, where the absence of Chekhov was one of the big questions that left me baffled. Who was this camel creature taking up space on the bridge? And where were these more animal-like alien crew members during the primetime series? This two-season animated wonder is often written off as another kid show. Although it aired on Saturday, the showrunner, Dorothy Fontana, who went by DC as women in charge of a production were still rare, wrote a letter to the LA Times in response to an article they published about the animated series calling it a kiddie show. She said, We are doing Star Trek in the same manner as the original series, with an intelligent approach to science fiction, stories with genuine, believable characters and containing a pertinent theme or moral. A number of former Star Trek writers are doing scripts for us, and Gene Roddenberry is our executive producer. To describe it as a kiddie show is to downgrade the efforts of the many talented people working on the project. At a time when parents are howling that the majority of material their children see on television is violent, puerile, and inane, we are attempting to present something much better, something thoughtful and thought-provoking. Please don't put us in the same class with Saturday morning kitty cartoons. That says a lot for Star Trek the Animated Series. Filmation was one of the most recognizable and respected names in cartoons, and I recognize the style and design of their animation in shows that would follow, like Black Star and even He-Man. By securing the voices of seven of the original actors, and even getting Walter Koenig to write a couple of episodes, the talent from the much-loved primetime sci-fi series helped bring more credibility to the success of this bright-colored animated take on the live-action show. It was the animated series that brought us Kirk's middle name, Tiberius, Spock's mother's last name, Grayson, and the first use of the now common holodeck. Although referred to only as the rec room, it operated in the similar way we are all familiar with. What I love most about this cartoon was that it fills the promised five-year mission of the original live-action show. Perhaps officially the jury might be out on this, but I know many, myself included, consider this show canon. What about you? Looking at it today, I still can't help but expect Eric Estrada. However, even he wasn't mainstream enough to voice a character when C-Lab 2020 debuted in 1972. This is the earliest cartoon featured in our show and was released while the youngest Gen Xers came of age and could truly appreciate it. Introduced to C-Lab via the Cartoon Network parody, I may prefer that one over the original with its voice talent and adult humor, but this was still a dramatic adventure series with a little bit of oceanic education. Sometimes the edutainment was pushed hard, but there was some light humor. Nothing like Estrada, Kate Miller, or Michael Gauze on C-Lab 2021, though. If you're looking for memorable entertainment here, don't hold your breath. However, there's solid, mature storytelling that some may find boring, but it is underrated. Debuting this animated sci-fi adventure in the 11 a.m. time slot made this a bit rough as it lost viewers while kids began heading outside to play. However, the action below the surface of the depths dealt with tough subjects and conflict that gave it to us straight, which was the order of the day for young viewers from our generation. Unlike so many cartoons from the 60s and 70s, I don't recall C-Lab 2020 in any endless loop of reruns, which is a shame as the adventure of a sea base inhabited with 250 oceanauts coped with anything from shark and squid attacks, anchor accidents, flooding compartments, radiation from disposed waste barrels, to even red tide surrounding the base cutting off their oxygen supply. And I thought red tide was a Florida invention during the last two decades. Tackling complex subjects for young ones, kids enjoyed this sci-fi of liquid space. No one said sci-fi had to be cosmic, and compared with other shows at the time, C-Lab 2020 is the real thing, especially with voices like Ross Martin and Jillian, and we've talked about her before, Pamela Ferndon. Perhaps it was the inspiration to Roy Scheider's Sequest live-action TV show in the 90s. Remember that? 
And then again, this was probably more entertaining. To this day, the unaired episodes 14 and 15 have never been released. What could they be hiding? Conspiracy theorists begin. Based on Flash Gordon, uh, no, not that Flash, these Flashes. Although I would have loved one based on the Sam Jones Flash Gordon movie, this little gem came before even that, in 1979. Gordon's design is more heavily inspired by the Buster Crab black and white serials of Hollywood's movie matinee days of the 1930s. And a cartoon based on the more recent Flesh Gordon was probably off the table. The original treatment included a subplot where Ming the Merciless provides arms to Hitler. Now you can't go wrong with Nazis as villains, but the time was changed from World War II to the present day. Probably best if you want to capture the last of the 70s Saturday morning audience. With a good run between 1979 and 82, I can't say it didn't help propel the momentum for the theatrical release starring Sam Jones and Max von Sydow. You know, the guy who died just years before at the hands of the devil and the exorcist. Mind blown? I know. This Saturday morning cartoon is both sci-fi and super, not to mention just made it into the 70s. As colorful and fanciful as the movie-based Flash, the cartoon is far less camp and completely void of sexuality. Whoa, how did that get in there? There is romance between Dale and Gordon, but no need for mass media sensualism. Less soap opera, more beating up bad guys in our Saturday mornings. And Flash Gordon delivered. The cartoon may not have been produced to market toys, but the success of the first season made a toy line plausible. The times were a-changing and a small line of action figures and spaceships were created. As the second season did not do as hot, the toys did disappear quickly. But the toy line garners much love and is sought by many collectors today. Imagine if the new adventures of Flash Gordon had been based on the film and Queen did the cartoon theme song. Now that's badass. This was the first time Flash had an animated series of his own. He would also return in the 1980s Defenders series as a member of a larger team and got his own reboot in the 1990s. These first three science fiction adventures are filled with exciting drama and story-driven action. We will get to three more in just a moment, but first, it's worth noting that some comic capers from madcap characters would latch onto the love affair with all things space. Beyond the zany collection of characters in Yogi's Space Race of 1979, a cosmic sequel to Wacky Races, the animated and much-loved classic Josie and the Pussycats would venture to the stars after their initial success of their original series to find musical gigs off-planet in 1972 as Josie and the Pussycats in Space. Original title, huh? After enjoying time on Goober and the Ghost Chasers, the entire Partridge Posse would blast off as the Partridge Family 2200, taking over for a failed Jetson sequel, came out in 1974. And it just didn't stop there. With the infamous sitcom cartoon spin-offs arriving at the turn of the new decade, even Gilligan's Island got into the galactic escapades with their second season, as the castaways escaped the island via a spacecraft of bamboo and coconut to find themselves on Gilligan's Planet in 1982. But until then, let's get back to more serious sci-fi cartoons grounded in a little more reality. Kenny, he's a man from outer space, and we're taking him to a spaceship. Well, Kenny just beam up? This is reality, Greg. A far cry from bad lip sync dubbing of mid-century Japanese Godzilla movies, the atomic king of the monsters had garnered fame in his own right here in the States as young people ate up any chances to witness the fighting power of the great lizard. Saturday morning cartoons had you covered in 1978 with a Godzilla show that had been referred to with more names than we even use for this. Many of the incarnations included being paired with other shows, including the Harlem Globetrotters. Two seasons of 13 episodes definitely proved its popularity, even as the oversized nuclear dino got neutered where it counts. No longer breathing atomic blue breath, he only breathed fire, but still had red lasers shoot from his eyes. Benevolent, Godzilla was there to help the human crew who had befriended his flame-breathing challenged cousin, Godzuki. The comic relief to give the little ones chuckles with his hapless smoke rings he would belch when trying to ignite a flame. It was Godzuki who could summon his big cousin with a spectacular roar. As for Godzilla's trademark roar, it was instead replaced by a growl provided by Moonraker Bond villain, Jaws. Hanna-Barbera was also required to eliminate any stomping on buildings or directly firing on humans from our overweight T-Rex. They took away everything great about the character for the US audience, as is usual. Animation was done by Toho, so I'm sure it aired in Japan. Or perhaps it was too much a dishonor to their country and they tried to pretend it never happened. Godzilla would feature in an hour or 90 minute long shows with other cartoons, but has simply been referred to as the Godzilla cartoon today. Looking back, it is unfortunate they were not able to use some of those more familiar monsters that Godzilla battled in his old silver screen days. Where was Mothra? Rodan? 
Destaroya, or King Ghidorah, if I even got their names right. Even so, there was no shortage of creatures to pit him against. I also remember the cute little wings from Mother Godzuki's arms, but also recognize he was one of those annoying little sidekick characters that often get in the way, but I guess some kids like that kind of thing. Give me atomic fire and wiping out office buildings with one tail swipe any day. And now for one of my favorites, and don't you dare call the Sun Sword a lightsaber. The mix of barbarian motifs with a purely sci-fi premise had me making sure not to miss an episode of Thundar the Barbarian. Every decade bleeds into the next, and the full decadence of the Decade of Excess had not quite hatched when Thundar was released in 1980, and the look and feel was still firmly rooted in the 70s. Swords and sorcery were huge at the time. Now just add in super science. The Empire Strikes Back premiered that year, so everybody was doing it. It just proved Star Wars was a force to be reckoned with. Get it? Force? Uh. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> a lot of scary things were on my mind in the early 80s. You know, like volcanoes and nuclear warfare. The idea of a planet creening between the Earth and the Moon, like the narrator so hauntingly described, was just another thing to add to my concerns. And no, 1994 was not that far off. A planet careening by didn't even seem strange during a time where post-apocalyptic Earth, a standard setting in media for both adults and kids, was enough to make my imagination run wild. I'm sure I had sleepless nights praying our moon would not break apart, causing catastrophic calamity across the face of the Earth. But when I wasn't worried, I thoroughly enjoyed Thundar and all of his awesomeness while fighting and while riding horseback with his compadres. Clueless of Earth's history, Thundar accepts the knowledge passed on by Princess Ariel she had garnered from her father's library. Princess of what is exactly not clear. Somewhat of a sorceress, Ariel was not always a damsel in distress, although often she took on that role. And then there's Ookla. The mock's design seemed to have tribal inspiration and was a cross between Chewbacca and Sasquatch to me. Although it's said to be more a bipedal lion, I just didn't see it that way. But he was fun, and his mount, I can't very well call it a horse, was the bomb. Thundar's theme says it perfectly. A world of savagery, super science, and sorcery. And I was hooked. This was not comedy, but epic action drama. There's nothing quite like the imagery of a flooded Mount Rushmore, the ruins of the Lincoln Memorial, and the desolate abandoned wasteland of Las Vegas to curb end of the world anxieties when growing up in this time. Even with all the frightening imagery of an extinct world seen in every episode, it was an adventure we were looking for. But with only a game and a coloring book for merchandise, they did this show dirty. It could have continued and gets far fewer modern treatments than it deserves. Lucky for fans, a couple official modern toys have been made of these characters. Hmm, not too bad. I wonder if I should. For our last trick, we venture only one year later in 1981 with a Filmation classic. Only months before the shackles of child marketing come off and a flood of toy lines with corresponding cartoons make their way to the masses, we got Blackstar. Filmation did not want to be bested by Ruby Spears, who was in their second season of Thundar, so Blackstar portrayed a savage world with a touch of tech. John Blackstar is an Earth astronaut lost in space on the planet Sagar and can do nothing but befriend native alien Mara and the Trobits. He sides with good to defeat the Overlord from total world domination of the planet, as a hero does. Blackstar is easily fantasy with a mix of science fiction. Technology, not just magic, is woven into the barbarian battle world depicted in this animated series. Even going so far as to tell a story of another astronaut, John's Earth girlfriend Katana, having also visited Sagar before him but fleeing after a confrontation with the Overlord. Just as he rode his dragon-like steed, he rode the winds of change as an obvious precursor for both He-Man and even Bravestar. Blackstar's ethnicity can be compared to the Native American of Bravestar only five years later, and the two halves of his Power Star Sword are reminiscent to the Masters of the Universe toy line origins of He-Man's Power Sword. All pretty convenient, I must say. Speaking of He-Man, to hopefully ride the success that he was gaining, Galoob created a toy line, complete with the Ice Castle playset from the cartoon. Which I totally should have had as a kid, right? Although, what did this playset have that Grayskull didn't? Not even a trap door. Child's play. Either way, it was too little too late. With only one season before being cancelled, new and more exciting fare was being released, and toy lines came around with accompanying media to help push the favorite franchises being made famous in the 1980s. Blackstar got sucked up in a black hole. Not too different than the one that got him stranded on Sagar in the first place. 
The 1970s cartoons were ripe for the Gen X audience and were the children of the 60s predecessors. The original sci-fi Saturday stars, the Herculoids, Birdman, the Galaxy Trio, Space Ghost, and even the primetime Johnny Quest to an extent, kicked it all off the decade before. But it would be these animated adventures of the 70s that the first Gen Xers born in the late 60s would discover when coming into their own Gen Experience. You could probably add a couple more to this list of sci-fi Saturday morning cartoons. Please add them in the comments. For this, I was trying to avoid big budget feature based cartoons like Planet of the Apes and straight up superheroes. Johnny would eventually get a reboot and after years of inconsistent reruns in the 70s, the Herculoids and Space Ghost would get additional episodes for the 1981 Space Stars, a Saturday morning compilation show where late Gen Xers could discover them for the first time during their Saturday morning sacred rituals. This is long before both Space Ghost Coast to Coast and Birdman Attorney at Law on Cartoon Network, personal favorites of mine. I know these all ring a bell, but which were your favorites? Which characters do you have a soft spot for and wish could be just as big today as they were during their initial run? Saturday mornings were special, and we were lucky to be part of what made them iconic to begin with. This is only one genre and a short list of those shows to grace our big box television sets during the time. Stay tuned for more of our continuing series, Saturday Morning Serial from the Gen Experience. I really hope you click subscribe to support the channel and even press that like. Now check out more great content on the channel and even the Gen Experience store. Thanks for watching and until next time.